Secretary of State, it's uh, wonderful to have you here in Pinewood. Uh, this is in my constituency in um, Beaconsfield, so it's an honor to have you today. Um, today I wanted to ask you, um, it seems like a lifetime ago, February seems a lifetime ago, and I wanted to ask you, what were your priorities when you started, and what are your priorities now, and have they changed at all, or, or what's the sort of um, you know, trajectory for the future? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing for me, and probably one of the big reasons why I wanted the, the job in the first place and delighted to have been appointed as Culture Secretary, is the huge opportunity we have here in the United Kingdom, uh, particularly in the space of digital and tech. And I think people often forget the D of the DCMS. It's not just culture, media and sport, it's also digital. So how we exploit those huge opportunities, take something like data, Data is the oil of the 21st century economy. So ensuring that we have brilliant data regime that means that you can exploit the opportunities of data, drive growth in a way sometimes I think other countries around the world see the threat. We should see the opportunity to create jobs and growth there. But then across the wider area of, of my brief, culture and creative industries is a huge growth industry in this country. Just look here at Pinewood. As you say, it's extraordinary at Pinewood um, I think about 168 Oscars have originated here. And even from the midst of the COVID crisis, already, thanks to interventions we've made as a government, for example, by prioritising people being able to come to the UK for high-end film and TV, mm -hmm. by working on a reinsurance scheme, Pinewood is back up to full capacity, creating those jobs and growth in the creative industries. So the two kind of come together in a way, both the initial opportunities that we had before COVID struck, but then seeing whether it's with digital and tech, how we can survive through COVID and then thrive and grow those areas, or in the creative industries, how we get them back up to strength with things, for example, like our, our record investment. And, and speaking of COVID, um, what, what are your reflections on, on the role DCMS has played in the past seven months um, to support the local economy and, and the UK in general? Well, look, when COVID hit, it hit our sectors really hard. And in, across all of them, we've been working hard to protect and support them. So, for example, in relation to the charities sector, we've invested three quarters of a billion pounds, 750 million pounds, to help small and medium-sized charities up and down the country to weather the COVID storm or when it comes to our fantastic culture and creative industries. My culture is not just the value you have from culture itself, marvelously enriching of all our lives, but it makes us a creative powerhouse. And once again, uh, as we have done in the past as conservatives, we were there for culture. We created the national lottery in the first place, biggest investment in culture we'd seen up to that point. Then George Osborne and others uh, created Creative industries, tax release, particularly the film industry, so relies on that. Another huge investment. And this third huge investment uh, that we're, we have with one and a half billion pounds in culture. Just sitting here in Pinewood, it's, it's sort of the, the heartbeat of the creative industries. And we're so proud. I'm so proud to have um, Pinewood in my constituency. But what role have the creative industries played? And, and what role has DCMS played in supporting the creative industries across the UK, not just here in England, but maybe a, a, in Northern Ireland, across all of the UK? What role um, have you had in supporting this vital industry in which I believe now we actually have surpassed the US in our production capabilities and in what we're doing in our output. So it's fantastic that we're a world leader, but I would just love to hear more about what, what you're doing to support the industry. Well, we're, we're not just a world leader, we're a genuine creative industries mm -hmm. superpower. And if you look across, as you say, um, the film industry, advertising, television production, uh, emerging um, technologies or emerged technologies like um, gaming, Britain, leads the world and it creates those sort of high quality jobs that I'd want to do or our children or grandchildren would want to do, jobs that will last into the future. And as you say, it's not just in London or the Southeast, it's across the whole United Kingdom. Take for example, Netflix. Netflix films in Newport in Wales, a show called Sex Education, which is actually a, a comedy drama, but that is exported around the world and is a hit in Saudi Arabia. And that in its own way is uh, projecting our soft power around the world. Or take 
um, Game of Thrones filmed in Northern Ireland or countless productions uh, in and around Edinburgh, another fantastic hub of, of film and television. And actually, when I was up in um, Edinburgh recently, you, you can see the, the creative power in the digital um, industries there as well. And I really see the, the opportunity here in DCMS is to drive jobs and growth in those areas. And I, I'm tremendously excited about the opportunities that we have. Um, I just want to thank you for what you did during COVID for the 1.5 billion that you invested in, in culture and heritage. And would you tell us more about what DCMS is doing and, um, and sort of how you're getting that money out to the front lines? Well, the reason why the Prime Minister, the Chancellor and I really wanted to make this investment in our culture, as I say, Conservative Party once again proving we and not the Labour Party are the party of culture. It was us that created the lottery. It was us that created uh, creative industries, uh, tax breaks preserving what makes us such a wonderful nation. We were talking about our creative industries. They rely on great institutions like the Victoria and Albert Museum in London or wonderful museums in uh, Birmingham, Manchester, but not even places like, place like Walsall, fantastic art gallery in, in Walsall. That drives our, our creative industries. So we were determined to protect that essential architecture, but determined to protect our theatre. Think of the number of films and TV shows that originate in our theatres. And we didn't want the temporary challenge, however great it is of COVID, to mean that we lose that cultural richness that enriches all of our lives. Think, for example, of um, our great orchestras. If you take, for example, um, the Royal Ballet, the Royal Ballet now competes with the Bolshoi. The same people that do the lighting and rigging for that can also have jobs here at Pinewood. They can have jobs in TV, it's a sort of uh, culture that feeds one another um, and it was essential that we preserve that. So I know that uh, across the country, whether it's theatres, whether it's galleries, they put in their bids, we're assessing them and the money will start flowing out the door in October, proving that we're on their side. We, we've seen a sort of technological change through COVID. We've seen more people reliant on online capabilities. And, and what have you done to sort of support the tech sector? And how are you building on that technology for the future? Well, I think a number of things. First of all, we've got to get the basic infrastructure in place. So that means the, the broadband and also means, for example, mobile coverage. One of the great things we've managed to do in the past year is to sign a deal with the big mobile operators finally to start to deal with those blackouts in rural areas. So uh, not when you're quite up the top of a mountain, I'm sure people want peace at the top of a mountain, but in those rural areas, uh, you can get a mobile phone signal, this, uh, this so-called uh, single rural network. That will ensure that people can access their, their mobile phones. Building uh, the new broadband and the, the gigabit, but also making sure we've got the, the rules that underpin it all. I think there's a huge opportunity as we've left the European Union. When you see in the US, uh, increasingly policy dominated by the interests of a small number of tech firms. Uh, countries like China that uh, heavily uh, depend on the state, heavy state presence. Uh, increasingly, the European Union looking to a more protectionist stance. We need to be a place where we're open for tech, open for digital, open for data, but also have those British values like the rule of law, like our court system, that can protect people's basic rights at the same time. And I want the UK to be a magnet for the brightest and the best around the world to set up those tech businesses and create those uh, jobs and growth that we so desperately need. Fantastic. And um, there's been a lot of talk in the media about cancel culture, about you know, our heritage and needing to sort of revisit things. And I'm very proud of being British. I'm very proud of our heritage. But what is, um, what is DCMS, what are, what are you doing to sort of protect our, our, our heritage? Or what is your feeling about the whole sort of cancel culture and what we've seen in the news? Well, look, just as conservatives, we put the money in to preserve our culture, we should stand up for our cultural values. Why on earth should we feel shame about singing Royal Britannia yeah. and Land of Hope and Glory at the prompt? I remember uh, one of my highlights of my youth to be watching it with my grandmother on TV. I'm so sad I couldn't go along and do it myself. We see this sort of, I don't know why we, we should allow ourselves to be ashamed of our history. 
Um, of course there are dark moments in, in our history, as there are in, in any nation's history, and it's right that we should shine a light on it. But we should also celebrate the huge strength. Take slavery. Clearly slavery was a, a terrible stain on the, the British Empire, but it is equally true that we abolish slavery. We're one of the first nations to abolish slavery. And actually it's the case that the Royal Navy spent huge amounts of our national wealth, according to some estimates, up to 2% of our national wealth every year patrolling the North Atlantic to stop the evils of, of slave trade. If you look at our values, like the rule of law, like a free and open press, they defined the Enlightenment and, and made our lives as rich as they are now. So I do worry that there is this, this sort of culture going on at the moment, looking back in shame on our history. It's, of course, there are, there are mixed stories, but we should celebrate that strength. And I, I'm sending this message out very clearly to our cultural institutions. Of course, they should be uh, talking about their history. And I always say, keep stuff in place, keep your monuments in place and use them to explain our history. Don't hide it away. Weak nations try and obliterate their history. We should look our history in the eye, confront it and celebrate our strengths as well. I completely agree. And, and even with the statues, there was a lot of dispute over, over statues. I and mean, what was your feeling about Winston Churchill's statue when it was defaced? Um, I, was, I was taken aback and actually horrified. Yes. Um, well, there is this movement, particularly amongst some on the left, who want the, uh, the history of Winston Churchill simply to be about uh, famines in, in India and about um, Churchill's role against the, the miners. Now, of course, everyone uh, has, has uh, mixed histories, but the great achievement seems to be overlooked of Churchill, the, the person who defeated Nazi tyranny, defeated the most racist regime in history. To paint that man in turn as a racist seems extraordinary. And it shows a sort of um, moral weakness of the, the left that, um, that, that doesn't feel content to stand up for for British values. And I think we as conservatives need to champion those British values because you look at strong, confident nations around the world, they don't spend their entire time trashing their history, they celebrate their history. And I think we have so much to be proud of. And, um, and you can tell by my accent, I wasn't born here, but I, I am so proud to now be British and, and to embrace our culture and heritage. And thank you for standing up for those values. But, and you're absolutely right. Think of the people around the world who've come to the United mm. Kingdom made it their home over the generations going back through the 17th, 18th, 19th, and of course 20th century, with things like the wonderful influx of the um, uh, Windrush generation. Think of all the countless um, jobs that they, they've done in, um, in our schools and our hospitals and what, how much our life was enriched by that generation come through. And in turn, I think it's so important that everyone feels that they own our culture and history. So I want everyone to feel the sense of pride that I have in the British Museum, in the Victoria and Albert Museum. They belong to everyone in this country. So it's important that we champion that diversity because it's one of the things that makes our country such a, a wonderful place. Why are our, our creative industries so vibrant? Because we have such a vibrant culture. Absolutely. Well, I'll be flying the flag for Britain. Um, and looking ahead, uh, what makes you optimistic about the future? And um, what what makes you optimistic about the plans that you have for DCMS? Well, look, we're a, we're a great nation and we have great strengths. We have great strengths in our creative industries and we're perfectly positioned. And I was talking here at Pinewood, what makes this a great place to invest? It's the strength of talent that we have in this country, the skills that we have, whether that's makeup artists, special effects, lighting, props, filming, actors. We have such a wonderful culture here the English language. We have our, our open um, society whereby anyone who comes here can feel uh, at home. We should be cherishing those things and driving forward our strengths because this country, it used to be the case, you know, I've got Canadian in-laws. If you, you look at, and indeed we were talking about this, your, your, your background in, in America, it used to be the case you'd pick up uh, your cutlery and it would be stamped made in Sheffield. Mm. Now, our culture around the world is stamped made in Britain. And if you think about where the growth industries are coming, the, the desire to consume 
British culture, British films, whether that's on platforms like Netflix, um, Apple, Amazon, all of whom are desperate to, to film here, whether it's people that want to consume British fashion from Burberry to Alexander McQueen, whether it's people that want to, to come and visit our great um, institutions. Uh, just yesterday, I was at White Cube, um, the, the famous art gallery uh, down in, in Bermondsey. We're the hub of the modern art scene. No, that's where the growth is going to come in the future. And similarly, if you look in the tech sector, uh, take a company like Ocado that I was at a, a couple of weeks ago. The sort of robotics they are employing there to ensure that your, your groceries are delivered to your house, it's, it's sort of like taking a step into the future, seeing these, these uh, robots whizzing around. That's British ingenuity, and that British ingenuity is in turn being exported around the world. That intellectual property generated there is being snapped up in every country from Canada through to Australia, through to, um, through to rapidly developing countries. That's where British strength lies, just like we had British strength and ingenuity that developed everything from Concorde to the steam engine. We are developing those technologies of the future, and they're increasingly technologies that don't rely on the traditional um, the trade restrictions. So I think there are many, many reasons to be optimistic, and that's why I'm so privileged at Department for Culture, Digital Media and Sport to be promoting those interest, industries and championing them. And what are we doing for, for the Red Wall area? How are we including them in the conservative sort of vision for the future? Well, actually, first of all, we're going to get that gigabit broadband, the extraordinarily fast broadband. We'll get that to those northern seats first. They'll be the first uh, beneficiaries, and they are being the first um, beneficiaries of it. In relation to our culture, too often culture has been focused on London and the southeast. We've got our cultural investment fund. That is about helping to ensure that cultural experiences are shared around the whole of the UK and particularly in those, those northern red wall seats. Take, for example, the Warsaw Art Gallery, a fantastic institution. We'll be investing in those sort of places to ensure that uh, that wealth is spread uh, everywhere. And also, what the first uh, intervention I made to support uh, one of the sectors uh, in DCMS during the COVID crisis was to protect rugby league. Rugby yes. league, now my first visit actually yeah. to sport was uh, to see the, the wonderful stadium there in Lee, just outside Manchester. And I was determined those clubs that form the heart of those communities are protected and preserved. People put their faith in the Conservative Party for the first time, and I'm determined that we will repay them. Dare I bring up this subject, but what are your thoughts on the BBC and um, where, where it's going? Well, look, I actually love the BBC. I think the BBC is a fantastic institution and is known around the world. But the BBC needs to represent the whole of the United Kingdom and, and everyone. It can't just be in thrall to a narrow outlook that reflects the values of people who live in the centre of big cities like London, Manchester, Bristol and Brighton. I think they've got it wrong in the past because they've allowed themselves to be driven by those values instead of the values of the entire country. And we saw that with the uh, extraordinary situation of not being able to sing Rule Britannia and uh, Land of Hope and Glory at the proms. I mean, any normal person thinks that's a complete outrage. Um, and similarly, the BBC needs to stand up for values of impartiality. One of its great strengths compared to broadcasts around the world is if it gets this right, it can be trusted to be impartial. But that goes back to the values. In being impartial, it must reflect everyone's viewpoint, just, not just in news out Output, but across the, the entire spectrum of, of what it does. And I hope uh, that the BBC takes this challenge seriously. There's some positive uh, indications there, but I've, I've been very clear about the, the need to address that. Secretary of State, um, talking about our values, uh, what are your thoughts on free press? Well, free press is one of the things that defines us as a nation. We often take it for granted but no other country has the sort of vibrancy that we have in terms of our national newspapers, our magazines. And I'm determined to preserve our press, including our local newspapers. That's why, for example, during the COVID crisis, I designated uh, workers in the industry as key workers. Uh, that's why they've been help helpfully been the beneficiary of COVID advertising. Of course, we had to do that 
anyway, but it ensured that there was revenue for them during hard times. And I've also sought to champion them. I thought one of the most outrageous things we saw was the failure of politicians, Labour politicians, to condemn Extinction Rebellion when it was literally blocking our free press, stopping views that they disagreed with being put out to the public. That is outrageous, but it's of a piece with the left. It's exactly the same thing with no platforming and all the other intolerance that you see. So as a conservative, I'm determined to preserve the values of the free press and to champion them. Talking about things that we're proud of, I'm very proud of our high street in Marlow, and um, it's a beautiful high street. And I know up and down the country, MPs are very proud and promoting their heritage high streets. Could you tell us a little bit about what DCMS is doing to promote heritage high streets? Well, as you say, Marlow has a, a wonderful high street. I know it well. And think of the pride that people get from having such a beautiful high street. It's not just the shops on it, it's the sense of place and our rich history. I think there are few countries in the world that have such wonderful high streets from the medieval to the Victorian to the modern. And I'm determined that we preserve those, preserve and enhance that sense of place. And that's why we've announced 95 million pounds to support our heritage high streets, everywhere from Huddersfield to Hexham, from Coventry to Kirkham. Everywhere we are investing that, that money. Thank you so much, Secretary of State, for being with us today here in Pinewood Studios and a conference back to you.